I'm paying for it. You're paying for it, dude. <laughs> I'm paying for it. He's paying for it. David's paying for it. Everybody's paying for that bailout. Jerome Powell has never been in these streets. He's never been on the street. I don't even think street. he's ever been like in a 7-Eleven, dude. There's some regional bank that's going to step up and take yeah. SVB's place. You know. BB blow up. So let's go and play the game over there. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Upside Mindset. We're sitting down with very successful individuals. Today, we are sitting down with our friend, venture capitalist Jason Kim from Legendary Ventures. Thank you for being here with us. And then uh, next to him, we have special guest Mark Lee from Sin Futures, which is a crypto derivatives exchange. And uh, so now we have traditional and new school banking and finance all together on one podcast. Thank you guys for being here. It's yeah. great to be here, guys. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. It always brings me back to my business school days. You know, I, I ended up like not pursuing that path in my life, but it always brings me back to it because the talks are incredibly knowledgeable and uh, edifying for people. So whether you're deep in the business world yourself or you're kind of on the outside, I think you're going to learn something today. And like you said, you've got traditional, new school, and a blend of both. Um, Jason, let's just get into it. What, what do you think about Silicon Valley Bank and the whole situation because you kind of have a unique take on it right that uh i mean people have covered it but still a lot of people out there ultimately do not fully understand what went happened yeah i i think silicon valley that whole situation is very very unfortunate because first of all as an institution it's meant so much for founders and vcs like you know over the last you know 16 20 years however um i do think that there is a distinction between banking and investment banking and i think you know if you get past all the generalities of what you're seeing in the public, you know, from a banking perspective. Um, I don't necessarily compare Silicon Valley Bank with a Citibank or a JP Morgan or a Goldman Sachs. Um, they're two different types of businesses with different strategies and goals. Um, I think SVB was a very innovative investment bank um, that was not only vested in providing traditional banking functions and you know, uh, services, but it was also, you know, very, very focused on, you know, supporting the ecosystem from a financing perspective. Mm -hmm. um, this is founders, this is also, you know, VCs. Um, and so, you know, I think the situation is more complex than what people see in the public view. You know? what, what's the easiest way for you to describe the difference? I mean, as, as a bank, I, I bank right. with a big bank. I know that, you know, you, you, there's different divisions. Right. I could divisions. get a loan at a regular bank yeah, too, but it's not an investment bank, but obviously SVB, they were almost blending two different styles together yeah. that are, are normally very separate, right? Yeah. If you look at the traditional banking infrastructure from like an architecture standpoint, like how they, how they're, they're structured and how they operate. You know, a lot of these things, whether it's just making deposits, which st stays on the more traditional commercial or merchant banking side versus investment banking, which handles more loans and more creative levels of financing versus brokerage where you're handling public securities or potentially alternative financing. Um, I think the more traditional, quote unquote, banking institutions all have some l level of separation, like you said, Andrew. I think the smaller mid-level bank banks traditionally kind of blend some of those things because they're they're they're, start, they're a startup up unto themselves right so they need to grow the business and i think in silicon valley you know svb's case excuse me is um you know there was no clear distinction to some degree with you know handling customer deposits and banking with uh you know business development right mm. so they're going to leverage both to try to build that business which is not wrong but at that stage, you need more rules and more discipline mm. to separate those two functions. For example, if you're a customer depositing money into a bank, right, there's a certain amount of de-risking and regulatory compliance that you need to handle those funds, right? Mm -hmm. right? So if my mom put money into a bank account, she's going to expect that money to be there. And, mm. you, ju and you just can't play around with it. Um, if for some reason you're taking some of that and you're starting to invest that, that's a whole different level of expectation. Uh, and disclosure and de-risking that type of blending, right? Um, mm. You know, per se. So, so who would you say? And, and Mark, you can also weigh in on this. Like, who were the biggest losers out of this all? Like, was it just people like me who had just citizens that maybe weren't banking with SVB? Is it yeah. small business uh, people who are banking with SVB? Is it the big startups or the big companies? Like, who really lost out? I think it's really the startups and the small businesses, right? Because it doesn't impact your average retail um, client because FDIC still covers up to 250 grand. 
most depositors fall under that on the retail side. Startups, though, were really relying on SVB and other regional banks like First Republic, so, uh, Signature Bank, for more flexible terms in the way that they lend, in the way that they deal with these founders, right? Because SVB, for example, for, has long been probably the biggest proponent of the startup industry. And so I think this is a big blow to not only startups, but the VC community. That was in the general. top bank if you're a startup founder to go to. Oh, whether, whether, yeah, whether yeah, you're definitely. keeping your actual cash value that your company has there or securing loans, right? It was SVB. It was. It was. But, but how did like the. We were kind of talking earlier, like maybe the taxpayers, like did I lose out on any of it in a way? I think, yeah. I think what Mark's talking about is one dimension of it and, and disagree, you know, agree, you know, agree, feel free to agree, disagree. I think there's multiple levels of wins and losses here, right? So there's the pure economic sense of who lost, you know, who won and lost, right? I think to answer your question, my perspective is the biggest loser, financially speaking, is probably the taxpayers, right? The right, taxpayers, they got to bail out the They got to bail everybody out in that kind of, so, in that kind of engineering scheme to some degree. But I think it's degree. different from 2008, right? We're not necessarily using taxpayer money to bail out the banks, which is why a lot of the regulators are saying, don't call this a bailout. Well, no, we are. I mean, we're I, injecting I, liquidity, yeah. but not at the expense of the taxpayers. Meaning, the banks will ultimately have to pay this back. Well, I could be wrong, but I, 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 I kind of disagree with that for one reason. The, the bailout of SBV was primarily coming from while they're going through a transitionary phase of insolvency, right, and maybe potentially reacquisition. It's coming from FDIC. FDIC is funded by taxpayer dollars. So at the end of the day, everybody in, you know, on this interview is paying for that bailout. I'm paying for it. You're paying for it, dude. <laughs> I'm paying for it. He's paying for it. David's paying for it. Everybody's I, paying for that bailout. Right, right, right. Um, I the guess, net net. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, of course, of course. But I think I agree with Mark with what he's saying, which is um, there's also causally related damages from this, which is, you know, beyond the pure economics of it, is who else is really paying for this? And I agree with him. I think the startup community and the small businesses are the ones that are the most affected because at the end of the day, they need some sort of creative financing to really build their business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, America is the greatest startup yeah. in this world. You need help to get and something off the ground, you know? And, and, and if you're not getting that help because you have innovative companies, albeit a little bit more riskier than a traditional bank like SVB, providing that type of like support, who do you go for, right? right. Like, so that's right, what Mark right. is saying, right? Like if you're a startup and you're a small business and you really need help getting off the ground, you go to a bigger bank and they're probably going to say, hey, you know what? Give me three years of your, your run rate. Give me your three years of your tax and credit histories. And a lot of immigrant, especially immigrant founders, don't have that. Right, right. right? They're going to so, ask for a lot of paperwork. Right, exactly. Right. And then right. they're going to go back. So there's a huge gap in the market right, right now because... You know, at what SVB, First Republic, in their defense, did really, in Signature, those types of banks did was they filled a, they filled a niche in the banking system for startups and founders that a mm. traditional big bank couldn't fill. I think that's, and I don't want to put words in your so mouth. So I guess oh, where will exactly all the right. founders go now that their startup bank, that all the startups were banking on, had a big mishap? Where will all the startups go? Because like we were saying, the majority of startups were at SVB, right? Or a disproportionate amount. Right. Where will they go now? Because maybe some of the uh, faith in these startup banks or smaller banks that are obviously operating completely different than your JP Morgan, Citibanks, Goldman Sachs, uh, they're, 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 the, the, the trust in them has been shaken. Where will they go? Because they, they still need these creative financing options, right? To, to grow their business and just be different. I think just from a treasury perspective, they'll start to move into the bigger banks. I know a lot of founders myself that are moving to the JP Morgans and the cities of the world. Some of them are going to the fintech solutions. Like you have Mercury, you have Brex. They've re they've really raised the limit on the FDIC limits to like 2 million, 3 million respectively. And the way they're able to do this is they use fintech to spread out your deposit across multiple banks. So you get exposure to, you know, you're really spreading out your risk. Uh, from so a, you give it to them and they spread it exactly. out. So exactly. So you don't have to yeah, spread yeah, it right. out yourself so it, and manage. It makes, as, a, as a founder, it makes your job much easier. But just on a side note, you're also paying for that when you could do that yourself. So if you're a real hustler founder, Mark, you know, agree or disagree with me, you don't really need those middleware companies to do that. There's nothing that prevents me and Mark from taking $2 million, for, for example, um, beyond 250, you know, you know, FDIC. Yeah. And just setting up, you know, you know, you know, seven or eight bank accounts. 
and spreading that risk over seven or eight bank accounts. Yeah, you know? it's just why do you need to pay all these other companies to do that? It's a nightmare to manage. Right, right? you're running so eight you're, different accounts. Yeah, so at you're a time. paying for you're paying for the convenience. Exactly. Yeah. Not exactly. to bring, I mean, just to bring it to layman's terms, I heard that uh, NBA MVP Giannis Antetokounmpo has forty bank accounts at all two fifty k each. That makes sense. To, yeah. Yeah, but but that's not a solution either because at the end of the day, to, to Mark's point, it just becomes an overhead. I mean, there are products with major banking institutions that will cover you beyond. You know, uh, you know, FDIC. So, for example, if you are, you know, if you have a million dollars, right, and you put that money and, it, and you're not covered under FDIC and you don't want to play this weird insurance game of creating up, creating 40 accounts just right. to make sure that you're protected, you could certainly go into an investment banking account, put some of that money into Treasury or some other really, you right. know, strong Yeah, that's government. actually what a lot right. of people and, are starting to do, right? They're, right putting some of their treasury into short dated US treasury. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. But that's completely government backed. So the only way you could lose that money, because it's by de definition, it's government backed, is if the government collapses. Okay. So it's probably the safest thing ever. So okay, so Giannis, if you're watching, you don't need 40. You can just do <laughs> what they just said. Just have two accounts. Listen to the Asian guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, we, we were talking about an analogy earlier and to wrap up this segment, because it's a great segue into our web three and traditional finance segment. But I guess like uh, we all are familiar with Liquid Death, this drink brand that's it's value very high yeah. and, and it's just- it's There's a lot of memes about it right now because the valuations are so high and people are like, literally this is just yeah. flavored sparkling water, but right. like cooler, right? Right. Um, so it's a real product, but maybe it's valued a little bit higher than maybe it should be. But I guess what is the, uh, is there a comparison between Liquid Death and SVB? Or like, is, is there like some type of parallel type thing. Well, I guess it just in the sense that it's hyped in the sense that like all the founders were going to SVB, right? They had a really trendy name. It totally logically, it just makes sense if you're a founder. Oh yeah, I'm trying to be millennial. That sounds like a millennial run bank. Yeah. Look, I think, I think it's interesting that you guys are trying to, you know, compare a, 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 a ready to drink business with a bank. Um, so I'm a little <laughs> stunned here, but um, I think if you were to find some commonality in that type of analogy, um, I think it's that both fit a really distinct need in the market, right? So SVB, to Mark's point, was really about servicing a, a demographic or an audience that just didn't have access to the benefits of traditional banks, right? Now, or they didn't I, like the terms or they didn't like uh, the paperwork that they had to provide, right? Or they couldn't. It's, it's also that they were just a little bit more lenient and flexible, like I said in front of the beginning of this, uh, this podcast, right? Like, you know, traditional banks aren't as aggressive in terms of lending and really fostering, you know, startup scenarios, mm -hmm. right? right. You, know, you walk into a Maybe they, bank they, or they a view it with a suspect eye more than yeah, a Yeah, yeah. I mean, you walk into a big bank and, the, you know, they're going to like you and they're going to love you, but, you know, without a 10-year history with them, they're going to basically, it's just like any other loan. They're going to KYC you. I don't know if what people know what KYC is, but they're going to due diligence you. They definitely want to know what your credit history looks like. They want to know three years of tax returns. They want to know what your you know annual sales of a business is going yeah. to be. So it was kind so, of a niche bank, sort of, or or yeah, yeah. or a very. It, uh, it was just a bank that just believed in founders more. Exactly. Than, right. Yeah. Like right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll spot you a little bit more because like I like you because yeah. I like startups. Right. And listen, not, they're not altruistic, right? They did this to build a business. In right. the last few years, they've grown deposits in multiples by catering specifically to startups and VCs. Right. right. So on that, so what, so the underlying tension in this conversation is, and I'll get back to the liquid death comparison is are smaller regional banks, right? Are they predatory lenders or are they founders? Right? Because on the one hand you could say, wait a minute, to Mark's point, they serve a niche because they, they, they help people that, you know, that's the positive side of the story, right? In terms of the marketing. You know, our, they're like our, Nissan. Like Nissan will give you a loan on a car more than a Toyota will, or a Mercedes. Right, right, yeah. right. Exactly. So, so the question is, is you know, it, you know, on the one, you know, there's two perspectives, right, to everything. It, you know, if you look at SVBs in these regional banks from a financing perspective, you know, are they good for mainstream banking? Probably not. Are they good for startups and founders mm -hmm. who have more risk and they're willing to absorb that risk? Great. They fit fit a niche. Right. On the other hand of it, you could look at th these types of banks as predatory lenders to some degree, right? Because what they're doing is they're foregoing some of the requirements, right? In terms of the, the, the regulatory, the safeties, the checks, because what they want to do is they want the customer growth. And as they get them in, they start lending to them on, on more riskier terms, right? So at the end of the day, that's, 
that's their business model and that business model didn't work when you see the macro micro economy just kind of fall right and so you know it, it, you can you can almost say that svb is also a startup unto themselves i know they've been around for 16 plus years so you could say that a startup was lending to other startups Pretty much. Yeah. And that's, I guess that is different. There's a lot it, of layers it, of risk there. Right. right. Got it. Right. There is. But I would say more than their business focus, their failure was really just in the treasury management. Right. It's not necessarily, they didn't fail just because they were lending to startups that weren't getting loans at the bigger places. It's just what they did with those deposits. Right. right. But, but, but I, but I would also, I would agree with Mark, but I also add on to that, that if you were a more stable traditional bank, they wouldn't have taken those risks. That's true. I, I guess That's for true. all the founders out there are people who are would-be founders or people, you know how people tend to follow founders, All everybody in B-School, whether they end up one or not, they dream of being a founder. What should you do? Big bank or small bank? SVB or big bank? Both. Do yeah, both. 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 Yeah. So have a little bit in a the smaller bank, have a little bit in, in the big bank. It's like diversifying your, your life, right? Or your investment portfolio, right? Mm. So if you want to do basic banking operations, right, go to go to one of the bigger banks because they're probably not going to risk that money, right? Mm -hmm. but regardless of where the economic position is, I mean, right? I, I think even it, if they, the worst case, right? Even if they do, if Bank of America, JP Morgan, they do risk your money, what people are betting on and the reason people are moving money into those banks is worst case scenario, they're too big to fail, right? So right. you're always protected is at least the thinking that most they're, people they're, have. They're locked in with sort of a, the old world. Exactly. The old world yeah, yeah, is yeah. going to protect yeah. people who are part of it, right? But that's not completely true too because in 08, the traditional banks all fell. Yeah, but those are investment degree. banks, right? Well, I mean, Citibank, I mean, fell too to some degree. Yeah. Right? But Everybody, it didn't completely like, It didn't completely yeah, It wasn't collapse, like a lean. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you guys personally know anybody who was freaking out over the uh, SVB thing? Like their money oh, was locked oh, up. Oh, they sure. They can't make payroll. Yeah. They were yeah. like calling totally. every successful friend they got. Like yeah. any, I guess, I don't know any stories you guys can tell. In, oh, without. I had a founder texting me. He's a friend of mine. So I knew that he took money from Silicon Valley Bank. He took a big uh, loan from them and he kept most of his money there. And he was telling me he doesn't know how to, he was going to make payroll, like you mentioned. He wasn't know what tomorrow was going to look like. He was getting on the phone with all of his VCs trying to line up bridge loans. And it was, you know... It was, he was freaking out. He was freaking out. I mean, it only lasted a couple of days because I would say our government moved relatively quick on this. But yeah, it must have been a hard 48, 72 hours for him. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, we, we had a lot of founders and I, I, I also knew people in the ecosystem that were affected by it. I mean, there it, it's two parts, right? One is... You know, even if even if the government was going to backstop that or the taxpayers to some degree, um, there's a psychological aspect, of it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where do I put my money and how do I make sure that that's somewhat stable, right? Um, and so I think a lot of our the people that I know, whether it's founders or VCs, were looking for alternative options, and there weren't that many other than the big banks, mm. right? I mean, you might have some, you know, regional movement, right? Like within that segment, like going from an SVB to a Pac West or a Pac West to somebody else, but I think a lot of people were just looking to move to a bigger bank. The bigger issue once they moved it was, what do I do next, right? How do I avoid this situation? Um, and so there's a lot of like to your point, David. There's you know there's different strategies on on de-risking that type of situation. One is you can go and open up a hundred different bank accounts. <laughs> I don't know if that there's that many banks to be able to do fit under FDIC. But I think this, again, goes back to Mark's point, which is you don't have to be at that level to protect your, your cash position. You can certainly have a traditional bank account. You can also set, set up investment accounts, right? And within that investment account, move money back and forth, which is what treasury management is. And as you put money into those holding accounts, right, which is these investment accounts, you could put that into safer investments like T-bills or you know, secured notes, things that completely guarantee your principal and you can move in and out of them. However, the, the key piece of that strategy is to make sure that you're putting your money into financial products that don't have, especially in this type of culture, uh, long-term risk or long-term mm. lockup. So in SVB's case, obviously, they put a lot of their kind of strategies into 10-year bonds and things of that nature, where the penalties were so high that if, that you know, with any shift in macroeconomics, so, for example, if the economy is not doing well and you're seeing interest rates just skyrocket, 
you know, uh, you know, it, with the interest that they're earning on these bonds doesn't cover the points that right. they're losing on the securitized assets. So basically, the SVB guys super did not predict this macro dip in the economy. Totally, it's yeah. wild inflation. Right, and they yeah. and they were so locked into these types of products, they couldn't get out with a without a penalty that was so high. I, they couldn't absorb that penalty, right? I so mean, if you have ninety billion dollars in a bond, right, and then the penalty fee on that could be up to fifty percent, how are you going to handle that loss? Right, you just right. got to eat the inflation, right? Well, you just got to you just got to cross your fingers and hope things get better. <laughs> right, right. I think David, to your point, no one expected interest rates to spike this high, right? There was no, there was no like, there's no expectation of that from the Fed. Um, what really happened is when they locked in that ten year bond for like one point three eight or whatever that number was. It sounds ridiculous today in an interest rate environment that's at five percent, but at the time, Treasuries that was were at what point two five. So it yeah. was, the, you know, maybe not the smartest move, but it wasn't a terrible move. Right. Not to go sideways, but I also think that the government has complicity in all of this. Mm. Right. Because it's because you got to do more. Well, no, no, no. I, I feel bad for SVB because they did all the right things. If you actually look at their investments, they weren't that risky. Putting money into a, a very safe bond over 10 years, that's where, where the underlying assets are really t-bills and corporate bonds You're saying doesn't for the fed to let the inflation get that crazy well no no, no 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 that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is is that i think i think the fed chair should be fired immediately because the guy doesn't know what the fuck he's doing at the end of the day the normalized rate right so you can't compare you can't keep raising interest rates with with a goal of hitting a two percent inflation mark when you're living in the fucking stone ages right two that threshold was what my parents lived through Right in today's modern context, where you've seen it, you know, an increase in labor, increase in wages. Like we have, we have a different lifestyle today than we did 30 years ago. So the Fed's perspective is, I need to keep raising interest rates until I get to two percent, which is when he was a fucking dinosaur. Right? Today's environment, the, I would argue that the normalized inflation rate should be five and a half percent. If that's the case, we're already there, based on our way of life. Right? Like the average income 20 years ago. Or even in the '90s or '80s and '90s was probably about forty-five, fifty thousand dollars. The average medium wage now, in today's context, is close to six figures. Mm -hmm. Unless you're living in San Francisco, where the, you're considered poor if you're not making two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year. So, 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 in my opinion, the Fed should stop raising rates. They're fucking it up for everybody mm -hmm. because we've already hit stable state. That's my argument. So, if the Fed stop raising rates. SVB might have not collapsed because in their effort to help startup founders by bringing in accounts, mm -hmm. by making the right treasury deposits, and, you know, investments, and then also giving out the right loans, in that cocktail, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have had any financial issues. Does that right, make sense? right, right. You're saying their behavior really wasn't that irrational. Right. Look, I'm, a, you know, I'm pretty progressive as it gets, and I don't, but on, on fiscal policy and economic policy or monetary policy, I don't really tend to agree with the Democrats, you know, like Warren, but I agree with her. That that asshole should be fired immediately, mm. right? If I was the president of the United States, the first thing I would do by executive order was to get rid of Jerome Powell because he's, 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 a, single, he's a single root cause of all of this, right, at the end of the day. And I'm convinced of it. Because they continue to convene to raise interest rates based on a not you know on a time not too far in the distant past, right? Mm -hmm. When you know eggs were right. like ninety nine cents. You know the reality today is that you know a, a dozen eggs are going to cost three ninety nine. Mm -hmm. So so I guess live if, with it. If Jerome Powell is almost like this uh, conductor in the orchestra of all these metrics like interest rate, um, you don't like the way he's conducting. Like you think he's basically a bad orchestra conductor. I think of he's, the things he's in charge. I, of. I think personally, I don't know. I've never met him. I personally, you know, he's probably a brilliant individual when it comes to economic theory, right? But in practice, you know, when I look at the when I look at the Fed team, right, who's making these types of policies, I wonder if any of them actually have created a business and started a business mm. and ran a business. Mm. They don't know what it's like in in the. They don't know what it's like in the trenches. They're yeah. just. I, I want to know generals. if they. I want to know if they. If they were a bougie group of people who basically went to, you know what I mean, who came from bougie families, 
who got a nice ride, who went to college, good colleges, you know what I mean? Learned a lot of fucking theory and then never started a business, mm -hmm. never went bankrupt. And then they got a cushy job making six figures, you know what I mean? Dictating to the world. All these right? macro things, right? Right, exactly. Macro and micro policies when they've never worked at a gas station and they don't know what it's like to feed their family. They don't know what it's like to be a regular person. Yeah, they're not a regular Joe Schmo. Did the people who work for the Fed, did their paychecks change once the economy went down? No. Jer Jerome Powell has never been in these streets. He's That's never been on the street. I don't even think streets. he's ever been like in a 7-Eleven, dude. Jerome... Jerome, All you right. got you guys should you guys should interview Jerome Powell and ask him if he's ever been at 7-Eleven. Uh, right. I'll Never. ask him. I'll ask him. Hey, what's the first row of snacks at a 7-Eleven? Huh? Yeah, he doesn't know that. I know that because <laughs> my mom owns a gas station. I know exactly what the first row is. But you know what I mean. Uh, I don't Jason think he knows. Jason for Fed Chair. I'm I'm, I'm campaigning. <laughs> J. Kim. Yeah. Uh, so, so these banking issues are unreal. The root cause of these banking issues is that the government is not implementing correct monetary policy that maintains that detente of growth over mm. loss. You know what mm. I mean? Like, you know, inflation is fine the way it is. That's the new realities of today's environment. You know, in terms of GDP growth, America has always grown at single digits, no matter what, every year. Right. So if you look at those two components and you're sitting in a meeting, right, like it shouldn't require an SVB collapse to start slowing down interest rate hikes. Does that make sense? No. Like it has nothing to do with SVB. Right. If, if the feds keep raising interest rates, it's going to put I mean, America is a credit environment. You guys know that, right? Yeah, th this is how the... This is America. America has very little economy. savings. We are a credit the, the, environment. There's not that many countries where you can have 10 credit cards. Right. America time. is like the greatest Ponzi scheme in the world, right? <laughs> I thought you said it was the greatest startup. It is. It's both at the end of the day. <laughs> because at the end of the day, we're a credit finance environment. Right. We have very little savings. And what this economy runs on is constant growth and yeah. innovation. Right. And there's startup. just that trust that the right. money's going to come back. Right, we exactly. Let it go and you we let just... it go, it's going to come back. Then it's going to go to somebody else. We're a highly made matrix economic environment right and for 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 a group of people to be taking such a linear perspective of such a highly dynamic environment is really messing up the system mm, right so there's going to be more svbs to come all right J jason i think we're gonna we're gonna wrap up this segment here because i think we could go on and on about banking but we got to keep it moving because we have mark here and you here at the same time because you guys are bros you guys know each other but we're all bros here but you guys kind of represent maybe different sides of finance. You know, you're more traditional, you're from the VC world. Uh, Mark is in Web3 and crypto. And I kind of want to know, I want to segue into this whole segment by asking like, how did SBV falling and collapsing? How did, did that have any effect on the crypto world? Did it help? Did it hurt? Did it make people think differently about crypto or made them lose faith in it or feel like crypto needed to be more regulated? I or or gain a, faith in, yeah. in Web3 and crypto. Exactly. Yeah, so I think we could look at it in two ways. First, it's become extremely difficult for the crypto industry to access banking products, right? So not just you know Silicon Valley Bank, but especially Signature Bank uh, and some of these smaller regional banks cater to non-traditional clients, which included crypto companies, right? Uh, there's this bigger push in the country right now, especially from regulators, to cut off crypto's access to banking. And it's already taking effect, right? If you look at what some of the regulators have said about the buyers of SVB and Signature, one of the things they need to do if they're going to buy the bank is they have to give up their crypto clients. right? So mm. I think there's this broader push by regulators to crack down on crypto. They're leveraging what's happening happening with the banking crisis to accelerate some of this. Right? On the flip side of this is it's really this, this banking crisis has really disroded trust in traditional finance, right? So people are starting to think, okay, so let me learn a little more about crypto and DeFi. What is it really about? Is it just about speculation or is it about improving accessibility, making products more approachable and making sure that people have complete access over their finances, right? The idea that the government could step in and just shut a bank down overnight is, you know, it's not one that's welcomed by everyone, right? So the whole idea of DeFi is you take complete control over your own finances. You trust the code, not the people. Mm. Don't trust Jerome. Trust the code. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the code. Yeah, but just, just, but just for the audience to understand, and Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong. 
if I'm wrong, but with DeFi, you could, there's still security issues around the blockchain and DeFi, right? Of course. I, I mean, mean you can still manipulate on-chain transactions. Not, maybe not manipulate, but there's always a chance okay, of a vulnerability, right. right? Just like Google can always get hacked, right? Your bank accounts can get hacked. Right. The likeliness of that happening, low, right? right. But that's because there are measures in place. So it's probability, so, not certainty. Yeah. yeah. So okay. DeFi as well, like our project, all of our products get audited, smart contract audits, by at least two or three reputable auditors. And this doesn't necessarily guarantee okay, that- I just want to say that that's what Binance says. <laughs> and they're under DOJ. Well, Binance is different. They're centralized, right? So they have centralized servers, centralized leadership. That's, and, you know, I, I, Mark, Mark, I think for a lot of people out there, um, possibly me, I'm wondering, and this is a big question, how is Coinbase different than Binance real quick? Is Coinbase safer? I, I mean, well, they're two different businesses, right? Well, they're two different businesses, but they're similar in the sense that they're both centralized exchanges, which means everything's controlled by a single entity. Yeah. Right? For the most part, there's like a parent company that oversees all the different right, projects. Right, right. I mean, personally speaking, I would think Coinbase is a bit safer because they operate in under U.S. Regulation mm. under they, SEC regulation uh, under too. SEC regulation, and as far as I've seen, they've always done right by you know they try to do right by regulators, by lawmakers, by by their customers. Um, Binance, but, but, you know, but has a, a but there's a but there's a but there's a, I agree with you, but there's also a fundamental difference. I and correct me if I'm wrong. Coinbase, I my understanding is that they're an asset manager, right? That's the way they've positioned themselves in the market. They're not an exchange. No, no, Binance no. is a pure exchange. No, they're very similar. They offer similar products. I mean, Coinbase does have an asset management arm, but right. their core product is their exchange. It's the trading platform. Yeah, I mean the way the, the way it's put, but oh, right, I agree with you. They're, they they have a multiplexity of services and products. Yeah. Pro yeah, but I think that if you look at their core focus, Coinbase historically and culturally has always came out as an asset manager, and then they've kind of evolved into an exchange. Yeah. Whereas Binance, I believe. It's my opinion. Started out as a pure exchange, and now they're evolving into other services like asset management. So they're both the same. I agree with you, but I think they just came from different perspectives, and I think I think that speaks to its culture. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so it also, I, you know, you know, I put I personally living in this country put value on a company that puts its roots here. Yeah, mm, like, definitely. Yeah. Binance, for example, is somewhere in you know. I think a lot of their operations are in Dubai, which there's nothing wrong with that. But I you got to trust being, CZ, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so and so the other thing I think what 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 Mark is speaking about is, and I don't want to move off the financing topic is that when you're making an investment, that's not just the finance piece of it, but it's the legal piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. So as investors, if you're investing in a company, you, you have to be aware of the fact that you know the best case is that you make money and things go well. The worst case is that if it if something if you run a miss or there's something that's going on um i think you know to mark's point making sure that you're in the right jurisdiction helps right, right. because there's yeah. there's more there's more infrastructure in the united states and the law and the rule of law here has been advanced enough to a point where there's some consumer protections that are reasonable right it's, it's, it's not, not the bahamas about, right yeah it's yeah. not just about like oh how good is this deal for me as far as my shares and exactly. ratios or leverage or whatever but i literally have to think about like okay if something bad happens do i have essentially somebody i can talk to exactly. Is the government mm, gonna right. help me out is so there a customer service? Yeah, so, so, so I'll give you an example. Like this is a this is a really classical example, right? This is one particular point of example of the situation is, like for instance, we invest in a lot of companies, right? Early stage founders, and it's pretty it's pretty well known that founders eventually like they kind of want to you know build a business. They want to raise money, build a business, tell great stories, right? But at the end of the day, there's also risks associated with that, and a lot of founders they're afraid of talking about the risks because they think that if you don't tell them the truth and tell them the risks. You're not going to invest in them, and that's not true. You know, I, I'd much rather find a founder who says, "You know what? This is what I'm doing. You believe in me or not? But by the way, I could lose all of your money too." But a lot of the younger founders are afraid of talking about the risks because they think that if you talk about something, it's like dating, right? You show up on a date and you're like, "Here's all the great things about me." Oh, and by the way, um, here's all the terrible things about me. No, but, you got you got to talk nobody, about. But no, I, I but everybody wants hinge. to live in the friend zone. <laughs> nobody wants to talk about the bad things. No, right? no one wants to talk about the red flags. Exactly. Yeah, everybody just wants to say, "I'm this. Look how I right. take you to this nice dinner." Blah blah blah. And then it's like, but what's 
But, but yeah, but, yeah but, it, but, but, but it's like dating. If I met somebody who said, you know what, here's all these great things about me, but here's also some of the things that you might not like, I might just, I, I appreciate the honesty and I might accept that and move on and that it'll be a good relationship. Yeah, but, so what happens in the startup world is that a lot of these founders will talk about the great things, but they won't talk about some of their challenges, right? Not necessarily risks because they're ashamed to talk about it. And they think they're not going to get support from it when that's not true. It's, 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 it's not, I, you know. I, and what ends up happening is, even if you invest in them, I didn't want to interrupt, what happens is over time as they go through the peaks and valleys of their business, right? Because there's no business that just goes up like a hockey stick. If, if all of us in, in, in this interview created a business, we're going to have good times, bad times. That's the point of creating a business, right? And, and taking it to some level state. So, you know, in, in the good times, everybody's going to be talking great. In the bad times, you know, what happens? Mm -hmm. And I think in the bad times, investors traditionally try to go out to the founders and just want some basic information of how they're doing. A lot of the founders today won't even give you that information. Because, they're, because again, it's that psychology. I can't be seen as a weak person. So I've got this pride and ego. So you know what? I can't tell anybody about the bad things because they might not invest in me. Well, it's kind oh, of and by the way, and, and even if you've invested in me, I can't even tell you that I'm struggling in my business because you might hate me and you might not want to keep giving me money or support me. And so they start not, so they, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. By not being honest and transparent, what ends up happening is they end up failing and the worst founders will then basically come out and say, hey, by the way, you know what? I'm not going to give you any information. The investors then feel like, oh my God, you know, I've lost all my money. What do I do? If you're living in a foreign country, to Mark's point, legally, you're not going to be able, there's no recourse. You can't go to someone for help. In this country, what founders don't realize, and if you're a founder, you should listen to this, what I'm saying, is that it doesn't really matter if you're an investor and you don't have rights to get information about the status of a company. In this country, the rule of law, especially if you're incorporated out of Delaware and, the, and, and just regulatory wise, is that an investor has every right to get every piece of information about a company. And if you're not willing to give it to them, they could take legal action to get it, get it right? So it, it's specifically like, for example, if you were a company, you know, registered or you're incorporated out of Delaware, the Delaware Chancery Courts allow every investor, regardless of what the, what, uh, what the founder thinks, to go and file a DE-220 motion and get all the information out of that company. Mm. So if a founder ever tells you, I can't give you that information, that's his prerogative. But at least in this country, the investors are protected. They have a recourse. Right. They can go to that and pull that trigger and say, I don't really care at the end of the day. I, and that's why America's dope for business. Right, yeah. right exactly. And, and that I can't get you that information is actually realistically in real terms, I don't want to give you that information. Exactly. And you can legally pry it out of me, right. but I don't want to. And to Mark's yeah. point, in this country, you have those options. Yeah. Whereas like if you're in Dubai or BVI or the Caymans or some foreign entity, you might have zero recourse at that point. Right, but, right. you know, I was just speaking, per personally speaking, right, from an investor's point of view, I mean, VC's job is to take risk, right? And part of that risk is jurisdictional risk. So you're investing in companies, not only in the US, but in all other jurisdictions, knowing that you take that risk for a higher upside. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So there, it's not like don't invest yeah, in yeah, exactly. companies based in foreign countries, yeah. but you're taking on a certain amount of risk mm. that you might want to really think about. Yeah, exactly. If you're an accredited investor, to Mark's point, you also understand that risk reward equation. You know that there's going to be, you know, if you're going that extreme, you know, for a big return that, you know, you should be aware of that fact that you might not have recourse if yeah. you're going into those companies. Yeah, and I agree awesome. with that. You know, it's... Okay, let's let's talk about. I guess that's uh, also a good segue into like the different types of funding because we're talking about investing in businesses, the risks here and there. But I guess like, what are the even the different types of funding that startups can get from different investors? Because not all investors are you. They're right. not all VC guys who went to did this, uh, got X and X degrees, and and worked in this and this. Right. Uh, a lot of it is like even just friends and family and different types of people, right? A GoFundMe maybe? Kickstarter? Yeah. <laughs> so in, so like on the traditional side, less, you know, more Web3, crypto, tokenomics and those kind of things. You know, on, from my perspective, if I was a founder, um, you know, there's kind of a, a trajectory with this, right? There's a path. So if I was starting a company, the first thing you do is try to get friends and family right it's like all of us trying to create a company. Like We're literally not, the people, I, like if I'm found, if yeah. I'm starting a company, I'd call you guys. 
Because I know you. Yeah. Right. I, I, uh, Bezos' I, dad gave him 300K to start right. Amazon, right? Like, I'd call Mark. I'd call you guys. I'd call my mom. I'd call my partner, Kai, whoever, right? You know what I mean? And I'd be like, hey, bro, I have this great idea. You know, do you believe in it? Let's, you know, invest in me. Let's pull it together and let's just try to build something. Is there right? pressure if you're that friend or family and you have the means to invest that like, if you don't invest in my company, then I think that you don't believe in me as a person. Yeah, for me, if I make a friends and family investment into a friend, I kind of treat it like giving money to a family member. I've already written it off when I give it to them. Mm. Because I want to set the expectation low. I don't want to impact my personal relationship with that person. So if I'm giving them that person, I know I'm giving it to them without any expectation that they'll be able to give it back. Yeah, right. You are willing, absolutely willing to lose this all this money and still be friends. So with if I say I'm starting a liquid death competitor called Liquid Life, <laughs> and you give me 100K, you're basically like, I'm betting I'm never gonna. You see really want to hit me up on Liquid Death, <laughs> right? Because I missed that investment, yeah. right? You really want. To, you're really trying to no, nerve it's me. It's just this. a trend. It's just a trendy topic right yeah. now. Yeah. So like, if you started a business and you know you asked me to believe in it and give it to you, I would do it and I would support it, but I would emotionally prepare myself that it's never going to come back because you're my friend and but, I don't want my and, relationship affected with you. And, and a lot of relationships, because people do not do what you just said, they are impacted in the real world. Right. right? And you've seen it. Dude, it, it, friends and family is the lowest level. Like it, it's the first level and it's like, it's akin to like giving money to your child, mm. right? Like when you loan your money, you know, to a family member, like you don't want to get into issues with that so you're giving it to them freely out of love does that make sense right it's well, not that different than buying your kid a lamborghini so he can have really cool experiences in high school right yeah you don't it's yeah you don't expect him to make money on the Lamborghini. you don't expect him to like go and get like a ceo job the next day and pay you back right so i i think you start you said that that was the first level friends and family call people you know personally know people who may be familiar right. familiar with your character as a person but they have no expectation uh, with how the business goes. Right. What's the next level after that? You've exhausted. I've called all you guys up. I've called my friends. I got some funding, but not everybody believes in it. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I think what? the next level. Well, up, actually, before oh, we ahead. get to the next level, what are some alternatives to friends and family, right? Because not everyone has oh, access. Yeah. Right? It really right. depends on your upbringing, your environment. Right, your networks. Yeah, right. exactly. So you're saying that if you're at a friends and family level, and yeah, what, are, what are some and things that are like aspiring entrepreneurs yeah. can do? Right. Let's say you didn't go to Harvard, your family yeah, doesn't have a lot of money. You didn't go to maybe one of these Ivy League schools. You don't yeah. have necessarily the most expansive network. Right. Where should they start? Mark, you're saying if you just don't have friends, friends and family <laughs> exactly. who have money. That's oh, what yeah. I just said. Friends and family yeah. are poor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're so, poor uh, or you don't have any. Okay, yeah. so. I don't know why everybody's looking at me. Are there, are there alternatives? No, no, no. I don't know. The, I well, don't then, know. You, then you come to Jason and give up half your company. No, no, no. I think if you're in that situation you then it's pure hustle right mm. like at that level super like, bootstrap yeah super bootstrapped and you've got a hustle to go and build that network and and, and you know and that might take time right oh, like no. you know that you've got to meet people and you've got to build relationships look economic your economic position has no bearing on how hard you hustle mm. right you could be the poorest person in this country but you could be working 24 hours a day meeting people going to events right networking and, and, and refining that and finding like like-minded people. It would be hard pressed for me to believe that someone in this country could not find a social base of people that really care about them. And you don't need hundreds of them. Like you can't find four or five people who believe in you. That's gonna help you out, right? Mm, yeah. That's what America is all about. So, um, so I think I, at that stage, you just, it's pure hustle. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with you. I do think that people often just look around like who's the five, 10 closest people they got born into around them and they might right. not have that available and just the people they were organically right. just born with. Yeah. They're off like watching yeah. sports games or whatever. Like this is like, we live in a country where people want to help, right? So if you have no help at that level, you know, my argument is that you can go find it. You know what I mean? Just be, be real, be a human being, go tell people that you need help, tell right. them about your ideas, you know, you know, out of a thousand tries, you're probably going to get a few. That, right. that or, or even just tell your story in a great way and go to the GoFundMes or the th right. some some startups have literally started off that. Yeah. Right? yeah. Especially right. years ago, Kickstarter, right? So uh, many consumer yeah. products started right on Kickstarter. So I, so, I, so I think beyond that level, the next level would be to answer your question, Drew, is, is probably kind of angel investing. Which and means, what is that? Well, I, angel is like not so as personal. It's the same. It's, to me, it's the same thing as friends and family, but it's just more of 
the extended friends and family network, right? Yeah. Where you have your friends and family who know other people who are accredited investors who can now, you know, kind of rally around you and give you more money. Mm -hmm. Why do they call it angel investor? Angel investor sounds cool. Is it because they come down and they're like, oh, I'm going to save you. <laughs> no, no, no. I think they, I don't know, Mark. I think for me, I think they call it angel investors because they're not institutional. And at the end of the day, they're just private investors who are willing to write small checks. Right. So to me, it's just a private investor, but it's just, they're not going to be writing. I, I think there is something to what just Andrew just alluded to, which is like the term angel is because they're the ones really helping you get that startup off the ground. Yeah, yeah, they're I the agree first with that. true investors that come in right? yeah. beyond friends and family. Right. And these angels, I mean, unlike friends and family, they're not writing off that money. They want to see a return. Right? right. So if I'm writing a check as an angel, it's not like I'm like, oh, I, yeah, I think you're so a great the, person. Go, go, there's go a higher, learn, right? there's there's a higher like, level I of want, expectation. Yeah. I want some money back. Yeah. Hopefully. The, the truth is they're not angels. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they, they do expect something back. Okay. Well, they're, they're, I guess they're the angels in the sense that they really do want to help. Right. But they're not like, they don't want to help as much as family. Does sure, that make sense? Sure, sure. So, and they're going to be smaller checks. Got and it. then the next level after mm -hmm. that is probably, you know, uh, syndic syndicates or potentially early stage VC, right? Mm -hmm. And the, those are more organized groups of investors, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what's called a pooled income fund, right? So... The money is now individual. It's not individual. It's basically pooled in some sense, um, and those and that's where the the check sizes get a little bit bigger, and then eventually you get to institutionals, and then you know from institutionals you move from VC into growth, and from growth into private equity, and from private equity potentially into the public markets, right? At a high, very very high level. Yeah, I always hear that's about the hierarchy of exactly. I, right, I always right. hear that brands like cool brands like Supreme and stuff once they get bought by private equity companies, then they become like less cool. I, I don't know. I, I love Supreme. I, I never thought, I mean, I think there's a difference between like, but it becomes, I guess, like now you're reaching the institutions and then once like institutions want to invest in your product, it's like, yeah, you have mainstream. a huge, but, but I would, but I also agree. Most consumers don't know that. Right? right. Like they don't know Supreme was bought by a corporate strategic. Uh, right? Are you also saying this because you have a huge Supreme skate deck collection? I love Supreme skateboards. Yeah. When you told me that 100%. I was like, Jake, I would have never expected it. Why wouldn't you expect that? Well, you don't have a Supreme shirt on, right? Yeah, now. I think uh, <laughs> that doesn't you don't make sense. Appear to me as a person who likes to jump on skateboards. I don't really skate because, as an Asian, I think I would get hurt. So what I, <laughs> I, I just, I just like the art. You know what I mean? I just love their art, so I, I collect them as yeah. like a collectible. Yeah, thing, no, it's right? a very it's organic, a like sh street culture. Yeah. That's cool. I, I could, I could never take part in the, some of those sports. Uh, I, I want to talk about Mark because. Mark, you run, you are part of a crypto derivatives exchange. What is derivatives for people and how does that play into funding maybe crypto projects? Yeah, derivatives are just financial instruments uh, for trading. So to give an example, futures, uh, some people are familiar with options contracts. So what we enable as a platform is trading crypto futures. Uh, so basically you're taking leverage long and short bets on all types of crypto assets. Okay, how's it? I mean, we we just gotta ask for the layman's out there. How's it different from FTX? Yeah, so we're decentralized, meaning everything's run on chain, everything's completely transparent, and we're non-custodial. What that means is we don't take a hold of users' assets. Part of the problem with FTX is they took users' assets and then they went and did something else with it with their related hedge fund, right? Um, for us, all of that is stored in a smart contract and it never goes to our possession. Uh, okay. So you can't move the money, even if you want to invest it, like Sin Futures would never. Exactly. Could it? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. What, what were you guys all thinking? I mean, I, I know that we've all moved on to Silicon Valley bank talk, right? But previously, you know, just a few months ago, everybody was talking about FTX. When you were obviously as somebody in that space, were you just like, whoa? Yeah, it was, uh, it, you know, it was hard because FTX became this household name for crypto. They became pretty much the face of the crypto industry here in the States, right? And so for them to collapse in the way they have, it was, you know, it's like a big disgrace for the crypto industry. And, you know, we knew that, I, I think for DeFi projects, we always knew that it was a net positive because it actually shows the weaknesses of centralized systems. There are some congressmen who are pro crypto in the industry, and they've even quoted, they've been quoted saying this was a centralized failure, not a failure of crypto, which is true. 
with DeFi, you kind of have some of the checks and balances in place. Like you have the on-chain transparency. This could have never happened because people can monitor exactly what's happening to funds, right? The other thing is it's non-custodial, so no one takes access. So the idea that someone's assets are taken out of an exchange could not happen in DeFi. So I think this has really cemented the benefits and the use cases for DeFi. Okay. Right, because you guys can't go do whatever he was doing with all the funds, yeah. go and gamble. So you're, yeah. wait, I'm, I'm trying to get this straight just for the people out there listening. So it, almost FTX failing and understanding why it fell, it could have even solidified people's more faith into DeFi. Yeah. And so, but you know, that's not, there's some positive, some negative, right? The positive is the people who understand DeFi, they actually truly understand the benefits now. And right. we saw this when FTX collapses, collapsed, our exchange volume started hitting all time highs, right? So these were people moving from centralized exchange to decentralized venues like ours. Uh, the bigger challenge though is, you know, if you look at the average person, the average politician, the average policymaker, normie person in the America. Yeah, a normie person, all of crypto is the same, right? So they don't <laughs> distinguish between yeah. FTX and a DeFi product. Versus DeFi, yeah. They don't even know the difference between Bitcoin and any other shitcoin, right? It's all to them. It's like it's all one big scam. Who cares? Right. So, I think the fall of FTX has really hurt the credibility of the industry, especially for the normie audiences. Mm. I want to ask. I don't want to, you know, just out of my, you know, stupidity. I wanted to ask Mark this because he's such an expert in this area. So you keep saying it's a non-custodial account. It has to sit somewhere. So I realize yeah. what a smart contract is, but I'm wondering if you've got a lot of open cash, right? So on the exchange, you have buyers and sellers. They're depositing it into a non-custodial account, but who? But there's got to be someone who still has fiduciary responsibility over millions of dollars on that non-custodial account. Who is no, that person? It's all, it's all on chain and all on contract. It's all done through contracts, and then the assets you store it in a decentralized wallet, which is your. It's in your possession, right? So who's yours? The, the user, the end user. Okay, so yeah. so so the author, so the the business per se, who is kind of the super user, right, mm -hmm. has has no legal access to the money that's being put in reserve to handle the trades, back and forth. Right. Is that correct? I'm, that, I'm just trying yeah, to understand. That's correct, yeah. Okay, great. I didn't yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I learned something new. Thank you, Mark. Also, on decent, a lot of DeFi exchanges, you're not necessarily trading against the counterpart. You're trading against an algorithm or what we call an automated market maker. Okay. So there, no, there isn't always another side of the trade. Right. There's the buy sell side, which is taking up against some position against the house, which is the algorithm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, that I, that is that's great to me as a model. I just was always curious, and I appreciate that you answered the question. Was you know even if it was put into a non-custodial account, someone must have access to that. I think what you're telling me is that the company itself doesn't have access yeah, to we, it. Yeah, we don't have that. Right, but the users have their access to that, their particular portion of it. Yeah. Does uh, that make sense? Mark, yeah, Mark forgive me. Sense. I'm just trying to make a very layman's analogy. It's like a, an Airbnb or like a Uber where the Uber doesn't own the cars. Yeah. So then like you're never going to run out of cars. Like the cars, they can never take the cars away. Is that is there it, some analogy? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Am I confused? Wait, wait. Let me, I, got, I might have a good analogy. It's like all of us creating a bank account and putting money into it. But it's one account. But at the end of the day, there's no way one person is a signer for all the accounts. Everybody owns their bit and piece of that account. Correct? So we, if, so if all four of us put in a thousand, you know, if we have in a bank account with a thousand bucks and all four of us put in $250. None of us has the ability to actually take out a thousand dollars. We only have the ability to manage two hundred and fifty dollars of that one thousand dollar, but it's one account. Am I wrong? Yeah, I mean it's a yeah, it's a reasonable analogy. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. it's okay to say I'm wrong. You know what I mean? I'm, <laughs> no, no, it's I'm, I'm because not, I'm, I'm looking smart. for another analogy, you know I mean? but so. it's it's actually quite hard to find a. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. why I was thinking about it that way. Yeah. It's really it, so. It's basically like a a pooled investment account. But there's no central authority that has the ability to execute on behalf of the collective, uh, right? So yeah, it's, it's written into the smart contract. Right. Language, so it's, it's right? like having it's one basically law. Yeah, it's like having one bank account. It's a pooled bank account, but literally there's like 1,000 signers on it, and unless you get all 1,000 signers, you can't effectively. There's no authority to commit that bank account to something. You can only commit your piece of it. 
Sorry, am, am I getting too like intellectual masturbating on this thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess do ultimately we, we are discussing obviously centralized exchanges versus decentralized DeFi versus regular exchanges. Do you think that after this whole uh, FTX thing that just the industry needs more regulation? And if it does need more regulation, who should do it? Because it, it can't be guys who all grew up with Jerome Powell <laughs> and, and then bro try, it definitely try, can't be because him because they man. cannot understand this new world right they're yeah. from they they don't even know what spotify is right they're they're still playing records and cds and maybe uh, jerome paul's on the vinyls man yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's he's on the vinyls so, so who because if it needs more regulation to create more consumer trust who should who's going to create the the, the regulation so right who should be put in charge of regulating yeah i think Crypto regulation falls into two camps. One is the SEC. SEC overlooks anything securities related. And then the CFTC that overlooks any of the futures markets, right? So for us as an exchange, you would, if we operated in the US, which we don't, we would fall under CFTC jurisdiction, right? But right now, as far as I'm aware, there's a little bit of a battle between the CFTC and the SEC because both sides want to plant a flag into who regulate, who gets to regulate crypto. Right, whose jurisdiction? Exactly. exactly. It's almost like uh, in the, all those crime dramas, the FBI is always fighting with yeah, local yeah. police yeah. to see who gets the case, right? The big challenge right now for <laughs> the crypto industry yeah. in general is a lack of regulatory clarity. And the reason for that is the laws that are in place and the, yeah, the laws that are in place right now weren't designed for digital assets, right? So what the SEC is trying to do is kind of force pieces of that law to apply to crypto doesn't always translate one to one. And so I think most of the industry is still kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting for regulatory clarity so that we can abide by regulation that we can, you know, operate with the, and comply to their guidelines. They haven't made that readily available yet. And it's a little disappointing because the SEC has really been regulating by enforcement which means without putting together the proper frameworks they're only going directly after crypto companies and bringing down judgment and enforcement as a way to set precedent on future regulation oh interesting yeah so it's all kind of murky right now so they're still figuring it out it, it is very murky yeah. um yeah do you do you think i, I think what mark is saying is that they're learning on the go yeah i mean i'd argue that we need more open dialogue between the crypto industry and regulators. Right. Mm. Um, before and before setting those judgments and enforcement. Yeah, exactly. Should right. there be versus, a, versus learning on the go. Yeah. Should there be an age limit on the regulators? Uh, <laughs> May, I mean, I, I, don't know. I mean, you know, other countries, uh, they, they had yeah. to just extend the age limit in France question, yeah. just to let uh, Macron still be the president, president right? Yeah, because yeah, they, they, were, they were capped at 62. I think our the cap in America is obviously endless. It looks like we're gonna. It should be. If there's I, no, I not, not, not even, yeah, if not there's no cap regulators. on the presidency, why, why 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 would you put an age limit on? But I, I think there is some argument for an age limit, right? Because at some point, the disconnect between what thirty? <laughs> <laughs> no, the disconnect. What, 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 becomes, would th what would you think the age limit is I, on I don't crypto? Know. Let's, oh, regulatory on crypto? issues. It's gotta be at least sixty-two, so if, like if France, you, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 if you if you name the crypto Web three czar. Right. How about, how about As a cabinet level position in the in the U.S. government, what do you think the age limit would be? I think you got to go with sixty four. You know why? Because a sixty four bit and N sixty four. It's a very digital number. <laughs> that's cool. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. It's like the it's old school Nintendo style. Although it's it? not necessarily about age, right? Like you can yeah, be yeah. older and still progressive about sure. you know, innovation and. But things. if you have to put it, he said sixty four Nintendo. What what do you think it should be? Well, the crypto industry would love it if it was 69. Yeah, yeah oh, that's <laughs> yeah, pretty that's funny. A, yeah, a that's... mean <laughs> number. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or four, 42. 42. 42 exactly. or 69. Yeah. 42 is those, a little Those young. would be the regulatory ages for crypto. <laughs> even uh, even, I, I even the porn industry would love 69. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess... Uh, but Japanese porn would really suffer, though, if it was the actors were kept. That's, that's true, yeah, man. Because yeah. yeah. they like, like the old guys. Older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the JAV. Anyway, guys, we're just for the man in this room too. Anyways, uh, I guess to wrap it up, like, I guess do you have any uh, guys closing thoughts on? Um, I guess we covered a lot of banking and finance, but uh, between FTX falling and SVB falling, falling all within like the past like seven six months, seems kind of crazy. A lot of stuff is falling, but yeah. I guess is there a 
Is there hope? Is there anything that the regular person can learn from it? Yeah, are, are the larger macro fears oversold? Is it just a slight dip in consumer trust and then we're gonna bounce out of it? Or you know how like everybody was writing all these pieces to go viral and I'm sure they had ulterior agendas, but this person saying, oh, we're all going down. Other people were like, dude, it's by far still the most stable system. Yeah, it might've fallen from where it was, but what are you gonna do? Put it in this currency or that, you know what I mean? Go somewhere else. Like yeah. America's still the most stable at the end of the day. But before we go into the future, right? And kind of like what I what I would love to get some information, like just get insight from Mark about is like tokenomics. Cause we were talking about uh -huh. traditional versus non-traditional financing. So in the VC world, a lot of the financing is based on equity, right? We buy something, you know, we take a percentage of the company and we're very vested in it. It's equity, right? We own something of something. There's also derivatives of that where you could do debt, you know, alternative financing, whatever it might be. What's interesting about the non-traditional world is they have a similar setup, but it's in their own kind of way. And I'm, I want to see if Mark could talk a little bit about, you know what I mean? Yeah. How financing works. Yeah, because it sounds web more uh, new world. school, right? For yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think being in the crypto space, you do have definitely more avenues to fundraising. Um, you know, just as Jason mentioned, a lot of crypto projects start similarly to, to Web2 companies with friends and family, right? Friends and family. Um, but where we have a little more flexibility is we also have access to something called grants, foundation grants, right? So there are a lot of these like layer one projects. And for those of you who aren't familiar, layer one project in crypto just means it, you can think of it as an operating system, like a Microsoft, a Linux, a Mac OS. It's a layer where people build their apps on. So these layer ones are incentivized to bring builders into their ecosystem. So they start handing out grants. They say, hey, Jason, you're creating a decentralized dating app, right? We'll give you a $50,000 grant. This is something that's not traditionally available in Web2 or just traditional startups. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, once you get to the VC level, like Jason mentioned, we don't always raise in equity, right? I think... In the earlier days of crypto, it was mostly dominated by token raises, which means you go to a VC and you typically raise through what you call a SAFT, right? This is similar to a safe in Web2 investing. It's a simple agreement for future equity. A SAFT is a simple agreement for future tokens. That just means the tokens don't exist right now. So let's say I'm starting up a project. I don't have the tokens yet. I go to you as an investor and I say, hey, I'll sell you some future tokens at a valuation of X. Mm. That was the typical method of fundraising from institutional maybe years ago. It's starting to change a little bit now just as the industry matures. Um, now, I think what's becoming a little more popular is we go the traditional safe route, but with something called a, a side note or a side letter, which really are token warrants, right? It just means if you buy 10% of the equity in the company, you will be able to convert some of that or all of that into tokens if we have tokens in the future. Right? Isn't that just basically a safe now? Well, Conceptually. Is it, yeah, is it because people are just not trusting the tokens like they used to? Well, it's also because business models are right. changing and some of these startups are growing up. The industry is becoming a bit more mature and because traditional VCs are coming into the space, right? Yeah, yeah. So crypto native VCs are happy to take tokens. There are some major Web2 VCs that have token only funds. But the majority of VC is still traditional VC where they're buying equity, right? These guys are coming into the space. I'm talking about like the Sequoias of the world, right? They're coming into the space and they're talking to crypto startups and they're saying, okay, this token thing sounds interesting, but we want a piece of the actual pie, which is the equity, right? That's mm. what they know. That's what they've invested in for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? So the benefit of these safes with token warrants is now they have some flexibility. We own part of the equity, but if you guys ever launch your token, we have a right to exercise some kind of conversion into the token. So from an investor's perspective, there's nothing to lose. Right, right. they're getting yeah. both. They're getting yeah. the, the more right. stable traditional yeah, thing yeah. they've been aware of for right. 100 so, years, and they're getting the new school. So thing. what Mark exactly. is talking about is a permutation on traditional safe notes yeah. from the VC environment. So in the VC environment, is safe is basically, you're investing on, on, on essentially a loan product. You're saying, hey, look, I'm gonna, put this much money in for this percentage of the company um, with this kind of interest. And if over a two year period, uh, you know, uh, you know, you could, you have the option as the founder to pay me the interest on the money that I've invested, right? Um, and if you don't pay me that interest, then you're gonna convert me into equity, right? At a certain valuation. Um, yeah, that was like the traditional convertible note. That's a traditional note. convertible yeah. note safe. 
what I think Mark is saying is that the alternative kind of non-traditional world of crypto and Web3 is going into that same direction now, where as opposed to you were investing for some sort of token economics, they're now letting you invest, get have the optionality of taking equity or converting you with some sort of benefit, right? With kind of tokens. Does yeah. that make sense? And the reason yeah. is the trajectory the trajectory of a crypto startup is very different from Web2 in the sense that the value capture sometimes in investing in these projects comes in the form of tokens. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And the reason is a lot of the projects that are being built today, their goal is to become a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO, which means the token holders cr capture all of the value. They make the decisions. They oversee governance. So. Really, as an investor, you want to make sure you have exposure to both sides, right? Mm. If there is an option. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I don't want I don't want to actually bring up another issue, but the, the, the an open question I think to, to this audience and to the folks in this room is, since we're talking about safe notes, right? Um, is I don't really fully con never really understood what the value of a safe note is, and I'm talking to you, Mark, about this because I've never seen a safe note not convert. Well, so, no, no, I completely agree with you. <laughs> right? So, like, what's the point of doing a safe when you know that the founders are never going to give you the interest back on the loan? Yeah. They're always going to convert it to equity because they don't have the money to give you back the interest in the principal. But I note. usually think of safes a little differently from convertible notes, right? I think convertible notes, you're right. They Well, convertibles are the same thing as safe. The only thing is with a safe is that you're guaranteed you have certain privileges on the convertible note. Yeah. So to me, my point is, who cares if it's a convertible note or a safe? If I give, if I, if I give, let's say, Drew a hundred grand on a safe or a convertible, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, uh, he's always going to convert me to equi equity because he's not going to have enough money to give me back my money plus an interest. So my my argument is just at a metaphysical level, what's the point of having a safe or a, a sh what do you call it? A saft. Saft when it never when it's always going to convert. Why don't we? Why don't you just do a straight equity deal? Well, with, because with, then with, you have to price the round. With a safe, you don't why necessarily would, have to price the right, round. You don't right? think that's an issue that you don't have to price the round? Well, no, because in the beginning, there's not enough traction for people to agree on a certain valuation. Right. So, would you do a safe note for something that's not priced? Because a founder can come back and later say, "Oh, by the way, you know, when I first talked to you, the value of my company was 10 million, and now I decided it's going to be 1 billion." Yeah, but that's why they're so. Let's say a safe that says, you know, the cap is ten million. Yeah, and you get a or a twenty percent discount, right? Sure. I, isn't that how a typical safe is structured? It, it does. But my point is, it's all gonna. Okay, I agree with you, but it's gonna all convert anyway. So what's the point of the whole thing? Why don't you just do a, a standard, you know, stock purchase agreement with for equity at ten million dollars? Well. I, you know, part of it is I think people just want to kick the can down the road. Right? Yeah. They don't want to make that yeah. I th I think the definitive. I think the answer is that for founders, whether it's a SAFT or a SAFE, it's an easier process legally. Yeah. Without having to get more mm. lawyers involved to get very complex on executing that yeah. investment. Right. That's it's also safe sort of popularized by YC. Right. So, yeah. A part of it is how much influence they must have. Right. Right, within exactly. the industry itself, but but <clears throat> but but they popularize that for different reasons, right? And so, I, I don't know if it's necessarily the right approach. Um, I think for them, the safe was 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 very advantageous to them because at the end of the day, they're they're an incubator, mm. right? They they come in and say, okay, we may or may not give you money, but I'm going to take some equity for providing strategic value add. So of course, as YC, you're going to do a note because at the end of the day, you might not be investing that much in these companies. So, right. it's so they're not going to care about those terms. But if you were, you know, a non-incubating, accelerating investor where you're just putting cash on cash into a company because you really believe in them, I think the safe doesn't apply. It's basically an equity agreement. You know, that's my argument, right? So like if I was an incubator and I was coming to the Fung brothers and saying, oh, by the way, I want 20% of your business and I'll give you some money, I think a safe applies because there's benefits for that yeah. mm. incubator. But if I, if I was coming to the bros and, and I said, hey, by the way, I just believe in what you're doing and I'm going to give you, you know, I'm going to give you money, then why wouldn't I just want an equity? Group? Yeah, definitely. I mean, hey, like we said, we got a VC, we got a founder, different perspectives. I'm not going to lie. Everything about the whole safe in the saft is... <laughs> went way over my head but i know that we were arguing about something smart um i guess long story short 
now, now that everything's happening this way, are, are we just looking at a blip or are we looking at something that's way more concerning? Uh, and then I guess we'll both get your VC perspective and the founder perspective. All these things happening, nobody could predict them. You know, you're you're talking about Jerome yeah. doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, he's too old. He's on vinyl. Um, I guess are we? Is it is it just a blip? We're gonna bounce out of? Or we got some stuff to figure out, or who's got to figure it out? The American economy, and it will always come back. So this is just a trend, right? So if you look, you mean some people are freaking out for for no reason? Yeah, overly freaking out. Yeah, it's overly freak out. If if you wait, this is like any other bubble. If you look at the last twenty years, there's always been ups and downs in our economy, right? And, it, and America always bounces back, right? Whether it's the tech bubble in the early two thousands, what was the financial crisis in 08, It always comes. You're saying back. we're not Greece? Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna come back. Like, and you know, if you give it two or three years. You know the market forces will stabilize is right? it just sensationalized because of the social media cycle and the way the the new cycle is even quicker obviously than it has been in prior generations there, there is a there is a big component of that right where where you're you're fueling the panic because you have so much technology available where and you, you just want you want to make money off the views of getting everybody freaked out right? exactly right so like there's that you know, component from a technology perspective that's impacting consumer behavior and, and, and investment behavior. But, um, you know, but overall, if, you know, I mean, you know, if, if we work on cycles, right? Eventually the feds are going to stop raising interest rates. Eventually people normalizing it back to basics. Right. Like, um, Amer like the way we behave as American is very, Americans is schizophrenic. You know, we want the excitement. So every three years, we're going to run up on FOMO. And then every three years, right. the party's over and it's going to be a hangover and we're all going to be suffering. And then three years later, we come back. Yeah. This is the American story, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. We're just, I mean, we're uh, just big, one big party. It's rolling party. And Jerome Powell should not be part of that party. Does that make sense? Right. Because he doesn't get it. You know what I mean? He doesn't realize whether he's there or not. That party, that part, we're in a hangover. The hangover is going to end. And then there's going to be another drinking session after that. He doesn't understand this at the end of the day. Right. I mean, I think uh, to your point, as crazy as uh, this all sounds to like people who listen to media, I remember, I think some older parents were actually getting trampled and possibly even killed over Tickle Me Elmo's and Beanie Babies at one point, yeah. which are really stupid investments. I mean, not to say that other people didn't, you know, lose on some stuff recently, but right. Talking about Beanie Babies and Tickle Me Elmo's. Yeah, we, we work in cycles. Everything is going to be fine over a period of time. Yeah, right. but I, I think in the in the media in the short term, it's looking a little bearish, right? And I don't want to spread any like fud or fear or anything like that. But you know, the interest rate hikes, what it's going to mean to founders and small business owners is, you know, their cost of capital is going to go higher, right? And it's going to be more expensive for them to borrow money. But even on the venture side, so LPs invest in venture capitalists, right? But what happens when interest rates hike this high is the appetite for risk assets drops a lot, right? So instead of putting their money in venture capital, they may look at more, you know, why put, why do all the risky investments when you could put five, get 5% 5 risk-free from treasuries, right? Right. So naturally you may well, have this cascading effect where ultimately you get less funding for startups in the short term, just because of the current risk, uh, the interest the environment, environment we're yeah, in right exactly. now. I would also, I would only disagree with Mark one area, in one area. Like you don't do venture investments to get 5%. No, I, I yeah. Regardless, right? Yeah. You're in venture investments, you're looking for some multiple or you're, you want to risk at all and make a lot or you want to lose it all, right? That's venture investing. So, but I do agree with you um, about, you know, about your statements about the macro economy. But do you generally feel like also that it's going to come back and everything will stay? Oh, of course. And it'll, crypto, it'll come will, back. yeah. I, I believe everything's I mean, going to come It's just a matter of time, right? It could be two years, three years. And, yeah. and as a VC, are there some good deals right now in the sense that you know how when there's uh, yeah, there's the, fear, yeah. right? And people yeah, yeah. are like, oh man, I was just booming two years ago and I was feeling like uh, all the VCs were knocking on my door. I was like the hot chick on Hinge. I was a rose. Yeah. And now I'm, uh, you know, maybe I'm. The missing story in all of this and the sad part of all of it is going back to Mark's earlier comment about startups and small businesses, there is a subset of good actors and good businesses that are being disproportionately impacted by this, mm. right? Some good guys are getting screwed by the bad actors. Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, there are great companies even today that are struggling, but they're making, but they're getting by, they're growing in terms of revenue, they're getting to profitability, and now they're just being lumped in with the rest of the shit. Right. And then they're just not getting those opportunities. And those are the ones that are really going to drive the next generation of growth in this country. There are good yeah. actors that are being 
typecasted and right. stereotyped as it, bad. It's almost with like the bad apples. Like uh, right, that's like saying Asians don't like you know In and Out burgers, man. That's not true. Right. That all we do is eat Who ramen and noodles. That? <laughs> Asians love a good you, is, is this sort of like deal. how there are some good guys who maybe own an island in a private jet and they're like, dude, everybody uh, everybody thinks I'm a bad guy now, man. I'm yeah, not, exactly. not all. There's, you know, th- there's, there's a good segment of yeah. great founders, great course, companies like Mark, you know what I mean? You know, that, you know, don't get opportunities. And now, now everybody's looking at him skeptical, right? Yeah, exactly. They're like, oh, what's this well, all about? Well, maybe you know? in our next video, we can talk about how we suss out who is an actual good actor and an actual bad founder. Yeah, that'd that be very interesting. Yeah. Negative stereotypes of good founders. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's so much content and obviously like, man, we sat here, we could probably sit here for another two hours. Yeah. But you know, I think at some point, YouTube says, yo, you guys should cut it at an hour and a half. So, <laughs> so here we go. Like, uh, too long, guys, too long. But, All right. Uh, yeah, no, Jason, Mark, we're going to have you guys back. Of course, guys, Upside Mindset with Jason Kim right here on the Fung Bros channel um, where we talk about so many things, successful people, smart people, people who are making a lot of money and making their parents proud. So thank you so much for all the knowledge you guys drop. Uh, please let us know if you made it this far, hit that like button. And thank you so much for watching Upside Mindset on the Fung Brothers. Until next time, everybody, we're out. Peace. <laughs>